2012, put these things up as barriers to pain medication administration. Uh, concern about the side effects. I think a lot of these really come down to you don't see as many kids as you do adults. And if you do, you'd be more comfortable. I guarantee the nurses in the pediatric emergency department and the docs are very comfortable with pain medicines because they do it all the time. Uh, we have unfamiliar with pediatric dosing. You know, with adults, it's kind of not exactly one size fits all, but pretty darn close to that. You can remember the dose, right? Uh, and you know how, how it's going to work. With kids, you got the milligrams per kilogram, and in my case, micrograms per kilogram with the fentanyl. This was a biggie in our world in Salt Lake City, criticism by the ED staff. Uh, and I won't name the name, but if you know Salt Lake City, there's only one pediatric hospital in Salt Lake City. Um, and the, the nurses there would fuss at the medics and give them a, a whole rash of uh, SH because they started an IV kit. Because they say, no, you shouldn't do that because you're going to mess up all the veins, so we won't be able to see the IV, right? Or if you give them pain medication, they would call on the radio for permission to give pain medication. They would say, no, don't give pain medication, just bring it in and take care of it. You're only 15 minutes away, right? No big deal. That brings up what Chris also talked about is the fallacy of the short transport distance. Yeah, it's a short transport distance, but once they get to the ED, what's going to happen? You know, Chris quoted you two hours. Uh, our, our place, we measured this approximately between 45 minutes and an hour, so we're a little better. And then how the patient gets in, goes through the rigmarole, gets registered, et cetera. Somebody goes in to see him, gets some pain medication. And I think the reason we're quicker at my hospital, frankly, uh, is because our nurses are allowed to get pain med before the doctor sees the patient. They don't need an order from me to do that. They do it on their own. Probably the biggest uh, education is, is the fundamental part of this, but I think the biggest issue a lot of times is IV access. People don't like starting IVs on little kids. On an eight-month-old or a three-year-old that's pudgy with a pudgy arm and lots of, lots of subcutaneous healthy fat, you know? That's a tough stick, no question about it. And the kid's going to cry. They're crying some because their broken arm hurts now. Then you put an IV in their arm, they're crying a whole lot more. So you have to, like, jump this barrier of more pain before you can give them pain relief. That's a big negative. So pain is common. At least 20% of EMS calls are pain-related, and patients may qualify for pain medication. And we did a survey. I didn't do a survey, so we looked at on the state database. In 2008, we looked at every EMS run for kids, and this was actually kids uh, who did 14 and under with a broken arm. Less than 5% have pain medication. When I saw those numbers, I just about cried. I just thought that was horrible. Because, you know, it's not immediate that you're going to get pain medication in the hospital. But the medics have been trained that it's a bad thing to do. That it's dangerous, that you're going to get yelled at, the IV problem, uh, as we mentioned. So, opioids are effective. I'm here to preach at you another evidence-based guideline is available to you. It was published uh, just in January of this year for pain control by EMS personnel, pre-hospital pain control. And it recommends morphine or fentanyl for pain control. Ketamine's an interesting option, and when this guideline is updated, that may be on it. But right now, they want to encourage, we want to encourage you to utilize the ones you're familiar with, and that most of you, I'm sure, have access to, is the opiates. Use them and use them well. The intranasal modality for adults and kids, actually, is useful and beneficial, but for kids, it's like, to me, the sun rose, the clouds parted. We all of a sudden have an option for kids that doesn't involve causing them more pain to give them less pain, essentially. So here's the guideline published uh, in January, as I said, pre hospital emergency care. This went through, this guideline, the same process I've talked to you about before, the grade process, where the group that developed this guideline looked at all the world literature on pain medication, uh, how to do it safely, graded the literature, and came up with recommendations. Fentanyl, uh, um, one of the other speakers said two mics per kilo, and that's actually how we use it. Uh, this uh, guideline recommends one mic per kilo and then repeat. So it's in that range, one to two. As you probably know, fentanyl gives you less respiratory depression, less hypotension, uh, it's shorter acting than morphine. Uh, so potentially some benefits for pre-hospital care. And it works very quickly. Squirt it right up the nose, 
parents love it. A great study that was done in our children's hospital uh, for uh, intranasal fentanyl in the ED, parent satisfaction was way above 75, 80%. They were so thrilled with it. They loved it. Here is the actual protocol itself. I'm going to run through this relatively quickly because my seconds are ticking away. One big part of the protocol I want to emphasize is that pain should be assessed in a relatively formal way. Use a pain scale of some kind. Okay, whether you do the 1 to 10 if it's an adult. For the kids, you've got the faces scale. I've got a couple of pictures of these, different scales you can use. But assessing the pain and then assessing if you made any difference is a quantifiable way to take care of your patients. More scientific, if you will. So use an age-appropriate pain scale to do that. You can look at a kid face in pain, and then you've got the faces, and so you can kind of decide. Here's one example that's commonly used, the faces scale for uh, kids 4 to 12. It's a little more challenging in the younger kids. So we're experimenting with uh, new pain scales to see what we can do. This is Peppy's <laughs> faces can be painful scale. <laughs> but when we use this, in study after study, all the children cry when they see it. So they all get fat now. So it's actually working pretty well. Um, so we recommend, again, using narcotic analgesics at this dose to start. Strong minute recommendation with moderate quality evidence. Then reassess. Does that mean using the pain scale again? Ideally, yes, but at least see if they're better. And then if you're going to redose them, redose them at half of the original dose. And just keep titrating it. That's the way we do it in the ED. You know, again, one size doesn't fit all, so that's kind of why I think this group, which I wasn't involved with, came up with a lower dose to start with. Good. In summary, kids hurt too. Um, they are little adults, I agree. Um, you can get pain relief to them before anybody else can in substantially better time. The parents will love you. The kids will love you. I didn't go into all of the, do they get less PTSD? And they probably do, frankly, get less sort of medical trauma and horrific memories when they get early pain management. It's a big deal. If it was my kid, I'd want him to get out of pain as soon as possible. Don't be scared of fentanyl. It's really quite safe. Uh, I am not aware of anyone in our experience and the experience of folks I've talked to having any significant respiratory depression with intranasal fentanyl. It just hasn't happened because the kids stop crying when they feel better. So you don't give them anymore, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. Don't start IV unless you get an IV. And my opinion, intranasal fentanyl is good for children. And that's it. Questions for me?